So before we get started, I will use this moment to plug a few things. And uh, I just want to let everybody know that if you're not in it already, we have a MLOps Slack community group that is open to everything MLOps. So if you're coming and you want to check out more about machine learning operations or DevOps for ML, as they call it, uh, feel free to jump in that. I will share the link in the chat in a minute. I'm going to have to go find it real fast. But um, And then there's also a machine learning operations or MLOps conference that um, somebody in the community has reached out and they are part of the community and they're putting on this workshop or this conference. And they said that they would give anybody that's part of the community a discount on the ticket prices. So if anybody's interested in that, I'll also put the link in the, um, in the chat. And I think that's about it. Let's go ahead and let's get started here. We've got a lot to cover and I wanna make sure we get to it all. So our guest today on the show, <laughs> on our weekly meetup, which is, this is a very unique weekly meetup. And I reached out to you, Anthony, about uh, a month ago. And I loved what you were doing. And I thought it would be very valuable to offer people some kind of workshop looking at how they can better their CVs and resumes. And you came right back at it with, yeah, I got a lot of material on that. Let's do it. Let's go for it. So for me, it's an absolute pleasure to have here. Just so everybody knows, Anthony has been doing this people sourcing gig since 2015. He's originally from Ireland, now living in Berlin, which is one of my favorite cities in Europe. So I understand why you're there and what took you there. There's the company he works for is also in New York City. So he's working out of Ireland, Berlin, New York City. Um, you, you also did something interesting, Anthony, which is you started your own meetup, the AI in Action meetup in Berlin, which I really think is a great initiative. And you're leading the AI in Action podcast. So you're no stranger to this format. Uh, I would love if everyone gives a warm welcome to our guest, Anthony Kelly. Thanks for coming on here. Thanks for being with us, Anthony. How are you doing today? I'm good to meet you, Oz. Thank you. Um, really, really nice introduction there. Uh, I, as you're right, I'm no stranger to hearing the sound of my own voice, uh, speaking and doing the introductions at my cast all called AI in action. For those who are interested, they also cover the areas of data science, um, data engineering, data analytics, and business intelligence. We call it, it's like the AI ecosystem. And I've been doing recruitment for five years now. Um, started off with no experience to become uh, the top biller of a company that was from the UK. Uh, to become the no, number one recruiter in that company across UK and Ireland in less than three years' time. Uh, so I, I achieved quite well. And I'm looking, what I feel always differentiated me from other recruiters is I always help my candidates give the best interviews or prepare their CV to be better to get them those extra interviews. So what I'm actually looking to do and what I'm looking to provide is I say I say choice. I wanna I wanna make every person that works with me have choice of the market. Um, I don't wanna. Ideally, I can have you having multiple opportunities, whether they're all with me or whether they're with your own sources as well. That's absolutely fine. But at the end of the day, I'm happy if you have choice, and we do that by getting you to the final stage as many interviews as possible, to get, receiving as many offers, to getting you as many interviews as possible. So I've got two different slideshows, one on preparing a CV, uh, which is more the short one, and then the second one on preparing for an interview. Awesome. Um, so, so, so before we jump into that, I wanted to ask you a few questions, if you would allow me. And I see there's a chat. Um, there's yes. a question in the chat, too, uh, from William. And we can get into that in a minute, William. Um, but 
I just want to know what got you into the recruitment space and what drove you into this machine learning, data science, data engineering space? Um, so, you know what? It's quite, it's quite funny. I, I ended up in recruitment and everyone will tell you this. They end up in recruitment by mistake. Um, I was actually working as a team lead in a telesales call center and I was, I was working these incredibly long hours. I was working 50, 60, 70 hours a week managing a team of 80 people in Dublin and a team of 250 telesales agents in the Philippines. So I was the first person in, in the Dublin office and leaving when the team was leaving in the Philippines five yeah. days a week. Oh. Um, that was all I knew. Uh, I, I don't have a strong education background. So I, I would say grit and ambition kind of got me into, into recruitment because a lot of people join recruitment and tend to leave very quickly because it's it's not a it's not an easy job um but but i performed quite quite well very early very fast um someone connected to me on linkedin an in-house recruiter that was my first ever engagement with a recruiter and then I, with that i joined a company called computer futures um and quickly learned the ropes and i had to sort of it's kind of like a sink or swim situation when you join recruitment yeah. uh, and, and that's that's how I got into it all right and so how does how have you seen the job market now since COVID hit what is it looking like in your opinion and especially when relating to machine learning jobs and data science jobs Be yeah real with so it, of all markets it, it is one of the most promising but still not as promising as it was four months ago um being being very honest um but i've seen a lot of i've seen a pivot and we, internally we made a bit of a pivot if you're sort of looking at areas that are going to stay prominent stay healthy health tech fintech areas of innovation is what we call them so areas of nlp computer vision so we've picked these areas because fintech and health tech will be least um will be least affected by this. And then the areas of innovation will still have targets to meet for their investors. Uh, we'll still have product delivery goals to meet. And, and we're finding those to be around a lot of areas such as like NLP and computer vision. And a lot of it, you know, especially being, um, especially being medical imaging is, is becoming quite popular now, particularly in Berlin. Um, and I noticed some really good companies as well in the US doing it too. Hmm. But there's a, there's, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot going on in these areas. Okay. And just to give us an idea before we jump into this, you, a rough guesstimate of how many resumes and LinkedIn pages you've looked at over these five years that you've been doing this. Well, if we say I'm connected with 25,000 people on LinkedIn, um, a lot of people you connect with also don't accept you as a recruiter. Uh, so LinkedIn pages, I would say easily over 100,000. Um, resumes, I'd say I'd nearly see at least 50 resumes a day. Uh, if you try and put that out over a year, <laughs> you know, you're probably talking in the tens of thousands. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you know a good resume from a bad one. So that I, gives us a lot of confidence when we're, when we're taking your advice on this. Um, and so, yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. I, I'll, without further ado, go ahead and, and let us know what you got, what you have prepared for us. And if anybody has any questions or um, needs anything, feel free to ask it in the chat and we'll try and get to that. Cool. So I did say on this slide, it's uh, top tips for any data professional seeking to review their CV. My initial background before I was recruiting for data, I was actually recruiting for uh, test automation and DevOps. And basically, on my very first day of all this, I took my notes from my last job, which was recruiting for QA and test automation, and brought it over because I find it's the very same uh, no, matter, no matter where you go. Just want to make sure there's something in the chat. My mic quality is kind of low. I can have a look. Just give me two seconds. Yeah, I think I hear you all right. Can you, you all hear me? Okay. I think we're good. We got a, 
we got what we got people <laughs> i'm sorry yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's not Maybe. the best but i can speak a little bit louder um but that's fine i'll just i'll just speak a little bit louder um yeah so what i did is i actually took all the work that i'd done previously in my other company um on how to build a good cv for devops or qa test automation and i replicated that from that to a data professional and it's I, I look for the same things all the time and the history of me finding this information is i see cvs all the time and where the difference is with it with a recruiter my opinion is a good recruiter will always ask why aren't you interviewing that cv and why are you interviewing that cv uh, so, so that's kind of what i've what i've built this on that's great to know okay. so I would always say, you know, use the, use the right headings to grab a manager's attention. Um, so CV is never one size fits all. So I kind of break it down into following sections. Uh, you can lay out like this. When people are doing their experience, this is, this is to me is the most important part. Um, I see a lot of times company name, job title, time I was there and three bullet points. That is a personal pay hate of mine. I've seen people who've worked in companies for four or five years and it's it's three bullet points. It's it's just it just doesn't give enough depth about what you're doing in that role. Um but I would always start with the most recent and relevant experience. So your your job title, your company name, I would always put in as well one to two sentences about that company because there's a chance that that company who you're sending a resume to has never heard of them or if you're relocating to another city you like if i tried to tell you about uh i'm trying, trying to think a company in ireland uh global or oh, global force i was like oh yeah i work in global force here's my company i'm a software developer nobody's going to know who global force are they're not going to know so they're a hr uh, software hr and award software nobody's going to know that but you could be applying to you could be applying to a HR staffing company or a company that has a HR software, and they're just going to breeze over that. They're never going to consider you. Um, what you want to do is you want to include your duties, your responsibilities, but then you also want to include your accomplishments. So if you worked on building a data pipeline, or you know, worked on a recommender system that was already in play, and and you you know made some changes to it, you also want to add what that meant to the business. So did that mean your searchability increased, that improved, your SEO improved by X percent? And then if so, and if you have these figures, you know, what value did that bring back to the business? So for us, you know, we see a surefire um, CV, a surefire interview on a CV is when someone can say, I worked with this, I built this product, this product was built to serve this problem that the business had, um, and this is the overall result when we built this product, it provided X for the business. That's that's where that came in. And if you can do that as much as possible within your CV, um, I, I think it's, it's really helpful. Um, also, when you're talking about technologies, you wanna talk about like the depth of experience that you have with each technology. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point that we mentioned before is how you were talking about, you know, this, can you just reiterate what we said before everybody jumped on about the idea of, if you're working with Python and somebody is looking for a Java guy or a girl, how can that help? Can you just talk about that again? Yeah. So I suppose I follow the same ethos that I, that I would have been mentioned to me. A good programmer is always a good programmer. Um, but if you have, you know, worked in the same company for six years and you say Python programming experience for six years within this company, they don't know if you're an admin or if, if you're a, not programming with it at all but even if you're a python guy and you're applying for a java role or whatever language it might be it's it's quite relevant i actually think if you have a well-written cv because you can explain why you're a good developer and why they should be meeting you anyway so you want to be explaining them how you're building features and uh, the depth of your knowledge are you into like if you're working with building data pipelines are you integrating these pipelines with each other are you then integrating these with you know build tools with um, aws are you you know, there's, there's so much you can include, but someone might just have, uh, you know, worked on, worked on building data pipelines, maybe two or three bullet points, and then tools and technologies, and it's just keyword smash. 
um, which is very frustrating to see. Perfect. Yeah, that was that was exactly what I was thinking about. So it's stuff like this. Um, this is what I mentioned here on the adding value. So you can see this one, article sales forecasting model, 25% improvement over old production systems. Its business impact is expected to be between 50 to 100 million per year. That's an example of an A-B testing, but that's, you can use that for anything. It can be for data science, it can be for machine learning, it can be for data engineering. Analytics, I've seen people who can do a lot of it on analytics as well. Um, and I think that's, that's gonna be a big difference. And that's what stops someone from, uh, from interviewing you versus just turning your CV to the next page. Education, so again, you wanna go education at the top, then followed by your experience. Um, so if you're, a, but then again, if you're a recent graduate, your education is the highlight of your CV. Um, that's, that, that's what you wanna, that you, that's what you wanna do. Um, so, Remember to only post your secondary degree courses um, and go into greater detail of these, go into greater details of your topics, go into one thing that I actually don't even see a lot on graduate and intern CVs is that they, they don't explain the challenges that they set out to solve. Um, they talk about what they build, but they don't talk about the challenges. CVs are also a way of addressing challenges. I would always say write a CV how you'd answer an interview question. Um, so I would recommend that in the same. So I'll come back to that question now in a second, just when I get to the end of this. And then you also wanna go with your latest experience at the top. Go all your latest um, education at the top, going down to, you know, bachelor, just for example, on the screen there. Sorry, there's a lot of uh, features that have been added to this. So when I hit next, it actually underlines the, uh, the topic. <laughs> yeah. And just so everybody's clear, uh, because I imagine some people are taking screenshots right now trying to get this. Can we share this with them afterwards? You can share this. I also have um, a short or one page PDF version that I can share with you that you can send out. That's, Perfect. but it, it, this is a lot more detail. Generally, when, I, when I'm talking to a candidate, I would send them the PDF and I say, I'm going to ring you to talk about this PDF. And this is what I speak to them about. Cool. Um, so this is the skills part. So this is where I was talking about, uh, you know, what you're saying. Um, don't kill your CV with skills. Uh, I like this example that I have here. A data scientist with two years of experience, but lists six programming languages on their CV, raises red flags. People look for specialists, data science specialists. Um, or someone who's got a specialism. You know, you don't want to go in and try and be the jack of all trades and the master of none. Write what you're really good at on the CV and highlight them and write about them well and give an example of where you've implemented this. So you've got stuff like this. This is a, a little bit a little bit different. We've got core skills. So you can you can write your core skills like this, um, or you can write them like computer skills but I would not rely on these to talk about your skills. So in some cases, I actually find CVs to be better written without these. I've got so much stuff here. <laughs> you can all see this. Um, so I would like to write them as projects as opposed to skills. So you're always focused on solving a business problem. So we're always focused on solving a business problem. And I've actually included a example at the end of this, uh, which I just want to show you and I explained it, but it's, it's very much the same thing. You want to talk about the end to end of, of what you've solved. Whereas someone just writes, you know, pro Python programming experience worked on a recommendation system. Whereas you get a, I see some great CVs where someone might turn around, they might say, I was part of X team. On this team, we were responsible for improving the recommendation system that was performing at X percent. Uh, collaboration with like the analytics team, we felt that we could perform or increase the, the return on investment or the, the value to this. 
So what I've done is, you know, if you re-engineer data pipeline, if you introduce a new technology, what you do, how you integrate this into the business, how you deploy this, and then you're talking about all the values, all the new technologies, and how you're integrating them and, and making all these pieces talk to each other. And then you say, as a result, this solved the challenge we set out at the start. You know, maybe it was improved the SEO by 5%. In fact, we increased it by 8%. This is the value. Um, and then if you've got any publications, I would include them more so towards the end uh, because they are very, they are great to see. And if you can buy, if you can get someone to buy into your CV, they'll read the whole CV. Um, but a lot of the times, unless you're going for a very research heavy role, publications will not get them to draw, the, to draw their full attention in early. And is this true even with blog um, posts? Again, yeah, I, I would say include it, include it more so towards the end, unless you have, you're applying to a referral or to a friend where you know that a certain person is engaging to your content. Um, you kind of want to lead with that. But I suppose as a, as a, as a, as a easier one or a more direct, I think, you know, if you can do your, your experience right and talk about that, that's that's where the real value is and then they're going to look and read the rest of the cv if they see someone that's you know talking about publications they'll just go up oh, too research focused we need someone that's more industry at the moment which even if you've got that mix between industry and research you still they, they still need to see the industry first unfortunately it's just it's just how the feedback goes um crafting the perfect cover letter this is what I would do if you're, depending on the level you're at, if you're very much up like, you know, the management level, the director style level, I would say individually create a cover letter for each individual position, address it to the manager, address it and write and show that you've understood the company, you, you actually have read what they're doing, address that, what you feel the challenges that they're facing based on your findings from looking at that company and how you would do that. Um, that that's what I would say, and this is to go for people where you know there might only be six companies where you could actually get a job, or if you're super niche at what you do, this is this is the approach I would use. And it's actually I've seen there's people out there who are like um, career advisors who who charge people like fifteen hundred euros to tell them you should write a personalized cover letter for each company. Um, that's that that you apply for. Yeah. They're making out real smart. And so, then I have I have an example one here, you know, for uh, the yeah, position of data. I, I want to apply for the position of data science. My CV with the detailed experience is attached. Um, this is where I would, you know, most cases try and work the system a little bit. You know, engage the managers directly. Don't don't go to this to the inbox. I'm a recruiter. I've been I've not been able to not get one person's email address. You guys are tech guys. You know there's websites out there that will give you someone's work email ending. You just have to get the prefix. Um, address it to them and say, hey, look, I wanted to message you directly because I like what you do. Read their LinkedIn, see what they're doing. Um, and then you're making that very relatable to them. But again, this is something that is for if you're chasing it or if you have a dream company that you want to work for, this is how you approach that one company. You know, if you have... Um, you know, your, your white whale to say, this is, this is what I'd recommend. Hmm. And so just, I want to pause you real fast, uh, and try and get to these questions here. I see Antonio had one in the chat. Hmm. He's asking about if you, he wants to change his career from software development to data science. Do you have any recommendations on how to go about that? Yes. So definitely I would, your resume should, should follow the format, as I've mentioned. Um, you want to be talking about the projects, how you're adding value. Um, I do think it's, it's one of the more difficult approaches is to go from software engineering to data science, maybe from software engineering to machine learning, or maybe come into a data engineering position um, first, pick up that sort of that ecosystem experience, that data experience. You see a lot of data engineers moving into ML. Um, now your software, 
skills will be very much appreciated and they are very much needed in these in these in these data teams you know they lack in most cases I'm not saying in all cases but in most cases they do lack a certain uh, experience where i suppose they're not data scientists aren't taught to speed up things or to do them to make them run more efficiently to shave off time off run times and um, solid principles isn't so much inbuilt into their dna because it's you know they might come from a statistics or a maths background whereas you know if you study computer science this is this is more your game so you kind of want to still write a very strong cv and talk about how you interact or how you engage with data where that comes into your team it might be something that you know you're you're deploying um machine learning infrastructure you're writing machine learning infrastructure that could in the right company that could still that could actually get you into a data engineering team or into a machine learning engineer role so it's about how you can relate that to what they're doing and and in, and in most cases um even now i actually have companies saying that they want uh they want the machine learning engineers to have software engineering backgrounds but then it's also the case when you get a software engineer they have to be committed to maybe going back and looking at their cv and saying okay i need to change this to make it more data focused and with that i just as i said it's it's just about talking about how you're deploying code or talking about what you do in software that is very relatable to what you could do in data mm. yeah that's really insightful and just before we get rolling, I see William has a question here on thoughts about publications when they don't directly apply to the job. Should you put yeah. them in? Should you not? Yeah. So I would always, I would always include publications. Um, just for me, I suppose this is, this is personal and this is off my, my own, um, my own experience. I find that they, 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 they hold less weight. If you're going to review a CV, they hold less weight. But if you have a publication on a recommendation system or how to, you know, it's something super specific, then in some, I would make a personalized CV for that, for one company. You know, if you do something in the area of geoinformatics or geospatial um, and you're applying to, uh, I'm trying to think of a company that does a, um, Up42 uh, or Re Technologies or one of these companies, then yes, it holds more value with them. So it's, it's kind of one to gauge. But I, I find that if, if you've done a PhD and if you've got publications that are not relevant to the company that you're applying to, they do, they do hold less weight. It's definitely going to come up in the interview process, but just in terms of getting over the initial hurdle of getting an interview, um, it's, it, as I said, the weight is more so in a role description or a description of yourself. Very cool. And so now you have an example. What is this example of? I have an example. I have an example. So one is from a data warehouse engineer who's working in Zalando for a year and a half. And this is what he has shared um, as his experience. And I suppose it's just, it's just pretty difficult. It makes it hard to work with. I suppose it's, uh, if I had a better example, I would choose a company that isn't Zalando. Um, but again, I, I I had to do this, these things under, um, I had to be relatively cautious about that because everybody in Berlin knows who Zalando is. They're a real good company. They only hire, generally hire really good people. But if you were in Portugal and you'd never heard of Zalando and you see this, you probably wouldn't think that this guy is, is up, to, up, to, up to that good. There's not a lot of information about it. Don't know if he, again, he could just be an admin function of Spark and Python. He could just be sitting there you know, running IDs, anything fairly simple or anything low level like that. Um, and whereas the comparison is, I wanted to explain them. So they, it's a little bit different, but it's just that it's, it's a guy who's a who's a machine learning engineer. And I just think it was it was a fantastic explanation of how he could talk about um, what he actually built and how he built it from from nothing. Uh, so it's it's an end to end development of how he explains what he's what he started, what he done, and then how he implemented it. And you can see it, it will clearly distinguish what level of experience he has with a certain technology. 
So he's got Python and Django. So Django's his framework, but he's used Python to build the entire web application for this um, data transcription uh, platform, which I think is it's just absolutely fantastic. And I think you kind of want to be thinking, how can you explain your projects like that? Uh, and it's it's something that I would say I get in about 10% of resumes. Um, but with this, you know, when someone sees this and they can they can relate to that experience and they can see how that's relevant in their business. You know, they might not be doing speech data, uh, but they can say, oh, do you know, we're actually, we're actually looking for a full stack machine learning engineer with Python uh, who can, you know, deploy their own, uh, deploy their own, their, their own code and run their own models. Um, but yeah, so, that, so that's that. I suppose if anyone has any questions on that, I think that's, that's me. That's, on CVs. Yeah, that is really helpful. Thank you for that. And um, giving a shout out right now on social media, for sure. If anyone wants to connect with you also, I think that you haven't hit your limit yet on LinkedIn or have you? No, no, I haven't. <laughs> so they can reach out to you on LinkedIn too. But now you have the next part. Before we jump into this interview part, I wanted to know, I had a few questions about the resumes and CVs. Does the design matter at all? Do not download your CV from LinkedIn. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's something that I see. Uh, like it's, it just looks like a, like a complete lack of effort. Um, and I know they say searching for a job should be easy, but it, you got to think you're up against other people. What do you think the other person's resume looks like? So it's, it's about beating without, without sounding bad. It's about beating or being on par with another resume. You want to make sure that they don't just flick across yours and go to the next person. You want them to read yours and not have to go to the next person. Mm. So and I kind of, I kind of go for simple. Mm. I just, I don't have any sides. I just have straight down, one page, uh, size 11 font, my name, introduction, all me, personal information, education, career. Hmm. None of this side stuff with bar charts coming across. I don't, I don't do that. That's me personally, but I, I think, you know, it, they're not necessary. They might take a little bit longer to do. I've never done one, so I don't know if they take longer, but I think, you know, it's just, just the old school format and, don't be afraid for them. That'd be more than two or three pages long. Great. Yeah. And, and so while we're talking about that and not downloading it from LinkedIn, I wanted to show a few because these days it, and correct me if I'm wrong, every time at, when do you start looking at someone's LinkedIn? Do you look at resumes, resumes, resumes? And then if there's something that sparks your interest, you go to their LinkedIn or yeah. how does that work? Or yeah. is it LinkedIn's first and then resume it, or? It depends. It depends on the source. The source might be you contact someone on LinkedIn. But if you want to be getting contacted by, you know, your dream company, or you want to be contacted by a strong company who have a good talent acquisition team, you want them to contact you. Or maybe not, but you want them to at least be looking at you at some stage. And a good LinkedIn is for that. And if we see someone good on LinkedIn. We've never, there's candidates out there who we haven't spoken with in my team. And we're like, you know, oh, I'd love to speak with that person. I bet they're great. Um, and and that, that's just it. It sets a perception. Um, so, yeah. But if we have someone who comes through an advert, we will speak to them. But most likely, I'll be speaking with them. I will have a look at their resume and their LinkedIn beforehand. And I'll be looking on LinkedIn to see if they're speaking at meetups or at events or whatever it will be. But that's just because that's a personal thing that I look for um, mm. as well. And are you looking at their, so I imagine you're looking at their profile on LinkedIn. You're also looking at what they're posting and yes. what they're featured in, all of that. And, and the same rules apply, I would imagine, for the resume and how you describe your work experience as how you put it on LinkedIn. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, they, they can be the exact same. That's fine. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good. Good. Uh, so, 
yeah now what's what's next what do you got in that box of tricks for us all right here we go this one is just a little bit longer and so now it's more once you get through the gates you've been able to land an interview how to go about that and how to make yourself shine in this interview process right yes we're coming perfect so just if we're all kind of data guys here um so i suppose to give you a little history for me my first one year and a half in recruitment i averaged about I had to get 30 people interviews to get one deal. Uh, and that means a deal is get someone a job at the end of the day. And I was, I was average. And then I really changed my game and I said, okay, look, I want to I wanna maximize everyone's opportunity. I want to start getting these people at interview job offers. And then I went quickly from 30 interviews to between four and five. Um, and that was with these notes and it completely changed the way I looked at it. Um, and we always used to have this, this phrase, it's not the, it's not the best candidate who gets the job. It's the best prepared candidate. Um, and I myself, you know, I, 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 I actually really believe that. Um, and it's feedback that I get far too often is the candidate didn't do the research on us. Uh, they didn't know anything about us. And I know you're still expecting modern day. Uh, you want com companies will make the sell to you. But as I said, I'm in the game of giving people choice. You will get further in interview processes the more you know about the company. It's, it's, they want to see, you want to see if they like you. But at the end of the day, they also want to see if you like them. And if you can't go in and you can't tell them anything about that company, they're not going to feel that you like them. They're not going to feel that you're interested. You're not bought in. Check out the website. Check out any articles they're finding. You want to write things. You, you want to check out their LinkedIn page. For example, look, there's an event. Oh, hey, look, you, you're at this meetup. I was actually at that meetup too. What did you think? Check the news tab on Google. Very simple. Companies, you can check out the rounds of investment. Um, it's always better to tell companies this, oh, I see he's actually, he's got investments six months ago. That must be exciting. You don't want them to tell you. Well, you do want them to tell you, but if you can do it, you look good as well. Check the interviewers on LinkedIn. I, I, I had a, can, I have people say to me, oh, well, I don't want them to know. I've checked them on LinkedIn. I'm like, why? You want them to know. You want them to know that you're checking them on LinkedIn two days ago, three days ago, one day before, one hour before. That's fine. To me, I actually prefer when people do that for me as well. Even when I'm speaking with people to do podcasts with them, it means they're taking me seriously. And, and that's, that's one thing that, that I think is great. Um, I share a lot of articles on LinkedIn. So um, articles, I actually have an article written about this. I have articles about uh, CVs, articles about new technology breakthroughs. That's, that's all fine. Other stuff that I do, so this is things I do besides my job. Um, I also do stuff with Coder Dojo. Um, I volunteer at certain organizations in Ireland. You want to check if this person has them. Oh, I meet with Anthony. He's a founder at an AI in Action meetup. Do you know, I actually attended that meetup. I didn't know that uh, he was the founder. I'm going to have to say that to him when I speak with him. And then, you know, straight away, you're getting across. Uh, you're, shown, you're shown interest because you've done research. Um, and you're automatically starting to build very good rapport with this person uh, subconsciously. What they'll start to think is like, oh, you know what, I just met Anthony. Do you know, what? I, I get the feeling. I get the feeling we'd get on because we have so much in common. And you just need to start looking for that. Um, the second point that I say is the star interview technique. This isn't new. Uh, if you research how to, in, how to pass an interview at Amazon, you will see the star technique. I have a very simple way of describing this. If you picture yourself driving a car and it's manual, you don't go from fourth gear to second gear to fifth gear, you'll ruin the engine. So if you just answer an interview by saying the start and leave out the rest. So a lot of people just say start and task or they even just say task and action and then they're missing it. You're ruining your interview. Ahem. 
Oh, I actually thought I had more on that. So yes, so what I say, yeah. So what I say is give an example for everything that you worked on. Um, so one thing that I would always, if, they, if someone asks you a question, hey, oh, have you worked on machine learning? I'll be like, yeah, I have, yeah. I've done loads of machine learning. Um, I would always link it back to a specific example or a specific challenge that you worked on. Oh yeah, um, what's your experience like machine learning? Do you know, I've actually been working as a machine learning engineer for the last five or six years, whatever it may be. I'm working with these particular technologies on a daily basis, but uh, I had a very interesting project recently where I had to work as a full stack machine learning engineer on a particular challenge. Let's say I always go back, as you can guess, recommendation system seems to be something I spend a lot of time talking about because I say it all the time. Um, oh, I worked on this recommendation engine. Um, and then you want to talk about, as I said, the example that I gave previously. You know, I say, oh, I worked on a recommendation engine. Um, we use Python, which, you know, a lot of people can, can give. So you want to talk about the team. Oh, I, you know, I was part of a data engineering, data science uh, cross collaboration team. There was analysts in the team. You want to talk about what your input was in the team, what the, each individual's person was, and where you are all coming in to meet in the middle to add to add this value. And then I would say, you know, know the difference between a good good example and a bad example. So as I said, it's situation, task, action, and result. So with this, you want to go into an interview. You want to look or you want to pick your core experience that you feel you can you can knock it out of the park with. So if it's if you're a data engineer, you want to you want to be going in expecting Python, big data, maybe streaming data, uh, maybe it could be a particular topic like Kafka. Uh, you might be expecting something on uh, code deployments, um, but you can kind of you can kind of judge based on a job spec what the five technologies would be. Another popular one is Airflow. Where do you use it? So you kind of want like. And you want to prepare a star-like answer for all of these. And if, if you feel it's seven topics, you prepare seven topics. If it says, you know, what, what, you know by looking at a job spec what it's going to be. But if you're working with me, I would like to know that I would have these sort of questions um, ready for you beforehand or what sort of angle it's going to go down. But if you haven't spoken with me and if you're doing this directly, have a look at the job spec. They give off a lot. Here's an example. Topics like this, it can be very simple um, and it makes all the difference. And the reason why you do it is because a lot of the time you speak in what I call internal language. If you ask me, what do I do every day? I work on Bullhorn, I find candidates on LinkedIn and I send them out to managers. That makes no sense to anybody on this Zoom, but that's what I do every day. And if I went into an interview and I said that to someone, they would have no idea what I'm talking about. So I have to tell them what Bullhorn is, why I use it, the reason why I use it, the value of me using Bullhorn and that brings to the business. Same with LinkedIn and the same with what a sendo is. And you need to try and bring that into, into you or into your interview game. Talk about you. So, uh, they, they do and they don't. They don't care about what the team does, but you need to talk about your individual contribution. Um, an example that I would always give for this, a hiring manager might get very excited if they see, oh man, this guy just came over from the States. He was a machine learning engineer on Netflix. He's going to be great. And then if everything he's talking about is, oh yeah, my team, my team done this, my team done that, they're never going to know how good this person was got to talk about your individual contribution. So the team was worked was responsible for delivering this project. Uh, I was a part of the team of four. One was UX, one was UI, one was data analyst. Well, I was machine learning. This is what I was, this was what I was supposed to deliver. This is when I had to deliver it. This is the value I was asked to bring by delivering this project, uh, by delivering this part of the software. And then when I delivered this, I was expecting each other person to have delivered this and when we did we were able to we were able to um release it or whatever it would be i know very hard one to say because each each story is going to be in particular to to someone um or that or a particular project one thing as well i would always recommend um, and i actually do religiously 
with everyone is practice, practice an interview. A lot of people say that, yeah, do you know what? Um, I'm, 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 great at, I'm great at interviewing. I'm like, how do you know? When was your last interview? 18 months ago. I was like, okay, how are you, how are you great at interviewing? How do you know? Oh, because when I interview, I get the job. I was like, but I guarantee you, you don't get, every, you don't get a job offer after the end of every process. What it is, is you, know, you go, you interview with 10, 20 companies, you get two job offers. And you say you're a great interviewer, that's 10%. 10% is realistically a fail. Um, Liverpool, my football team, are the best football team in the world right now. They practice five days a week to play one game on the weekend. They practice. You want to be a, I video record myself, I voice record myself. And then when you listen back and you hear all these extra little things, you will correct yourself on the star interview technique. And you will then start critiquing yourself of where you've gone wrong and where you could have gone better. And actually, do you know what? If I wasn't me, I wouldn't understand what that answer means. And that's where I mean practice. And take it into example, you know, Roger Federer, tennis, or anything. <laughs> yeah, and it gives you that ability to articulate yourself better. I notice just by doing these every week that later I, I see oh, I say the same word over and over, or, oh, I, I say um too much maybe. And so if you're recording yourself continuously, you're going to get better and take out those unnecessary ticks that you have that can give off some nervousness or whatever it is. And so I, I definitely agree with that practice. And we all know that you never learn anything without practice. Yes, but not many people practice interviews. Um, and, and that's one thing that I, that I found. <clears throat> Here's my example. I did say Barcelona or Real Madrid. I think I did make these slides last year before Liverpool won the Champions League. Record yourself and listen back. Um, try it in the mirror or ask a friend, colleague, uh, partner to listen to you. And if they can understand what you mean, then you know you got it. Rate your own answers. Be harsh. Um, I got my job in recruitment because I, uh, I video record myself and uh, it was something that was new to me and um, I, done, I done pretty well in that. Having questions prepared. So I, I kind of think there's two parts to this. There's having questions pre-prepared and then there's also having questions that you understand in the interview. So pre-prepared questions, you know, what's the challenges do you face? Uh, what trends you see in technology affected your environment? Those are kind of expected. You know, culture. Um, how do you how do you rate someone as a good employee? Uh, I also think that there's some questions that you can ask that I would call maybe like a killer question. You know, if I was to get this job after six months, how would you how would you rate me as being a successful hire? What would I have brought to the table? And then they're going to come back and say, oh, you know, you, you would have actually been able to, to work on this project and add this sort of value. Gives you an opportunity to go back. Actually, do you know what? I've done that in this company. We haven't talked about it in the interview, but I just want to tell you now while we're on the topic. Um, you want to look out for the questions like that, along with what I would also say, if they mention something in the interview, that you ask, you want to ask a question about, ask a question. Again, shows you're listening, shows better communication. They're going to be like, you know, this guy gets me. He was answering back. He was answer, He was asking questions about what I was telling him. He was engaged. He was listening. So there's two types of questions. Um, it's very basic question, questions about the company, questions about the role. Um, and then I would always say, let them know you're interested. Not many candidates do it, uh, but again, if you want to give yourself choice, this also comes into the culture aspect of things. Uh, they'll say, you know, if someone fails of a cult culture interview, I would say 80% of the time, that's because they don't think you'd like to work there or you haven't showed enough excitement about their company for them to feel like they want you there. Um, and I know how that is, and I'm, I don't like people saying they failed interviews on culture because I, I don't think it's fair. Um, and it's very hard to judge someone in an interview. But this mm. is where I would always say, do you know what? Pick out points from the interview that you liked, the job spec or things you've discussed. That's why I want to work it. Do you know what? I, 
do you know what, Anthony? I'd really love to work with you on all this because I've seen that you do an AI in Action podcast, AI in Action meetups. You seem to share great content on LinkedIn. You look like you're a really friendly guy to work with. I think I'd get on well with you. I'd love to join your team. I'm leaving, man. This guy, if he, if he joined my team, he'd put his heart and soul into it. I want him part of my team. And it's so simple and yet so effective. It's good. Cool. And then also, if they're ever between two candidates, they're going to go with the guy they know likes them. There's a sign-off process within all these companies. If you want to say, oh, look, we want to hire X and Y, we can only get sign-off to, to raise one offer. They can't go, oh, we want to hire one guy, but we've got two candidates that might take it. Can we get sign-off for both of them? No, it doesn't work like that. They're going to come in and they're going to say, we like this guy. Can we get sign-off for him? And if you've let them know, if they feel you're going to take it, that's going to be you. Now, you might have said this to two or three other companies, but then you're getting two or three different choices. And as I said, I'm here to try and help you get choice. Um, I think this might be the last part I have on this, but it's challenges or mistakes you've made. This to me is uh, it's kind of like a fluffy communication style question. Um, you don't want to be the person that's never had a mistake that in their whole lives. Um, you want to be able to tell them how you had a mistake and how you won't have that mistake again. Um, so there's a, there's a story I heard about a truck driver and it was a truck driver who was driving like the HGV delivery trucks and he was there for like six years. One day he came in and he crashed the truck into another truck in the yard and the next day came into his boss and he handed him the keys. This is actually a true story of someone I know in Ireland. Uh, he handed his boss the keys. He said, look, I'm sorry about yesterday. Um, I've cost you a lot of money. Here's my keys. I'm going to resign. And the boss said, no, do you think I'm going to let you have that experience of having that crash, knowing you're never going to crash again because you're going to be extra careful. I'm going to let you give that experience to someone else after me paying for your accident. So, it's a way, it, uh, an example that someone told me was they tried to implement test-driven development before after watching an online webinar. And then their next code that they tried to do in test-driven development failed. But then his boss actually turned around to him after and said, I see you trying to do test-driven development here. You know, that didn't work. But we actually have a guy who specializes in that in the team. Why don't you link up with him on the next project and then try and run it in test-driven development? And then we can see where you go from that. And then, like, it's just it's just great. It shows that you failed. It shows that you, sh you showed you wanted to improve and you showed the capability and that you wanted and the effort that you've actually made to improve. Or it could be something that you approached your boss about this particular thing or technology that you wanted to improve on. And yeah, real fast, I know that uh, you interviewed Alexi, right? I think that's how I may have even found you, who's a predominant data scientist on... Uh, LinkedIn, and he shares a lot of great tips about getting jobs for data scientists. And he has a GitHub um, repo that I'm going to put in the chat, and it's just a bunch of data science interview questions. Yeah, so, 160. Yeah, 160 different questions that, uh, and people, he kind of crowdsourced the whole thing. So people have put their best answers to these questions. So hopefully that can be a great resource for everybody too. But that was my last slide um, on the how to prepare for an interview. Awesome. Awesome stuff. So if anybody has any questions, you can throw it in the chat or uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away. Feel free. I'll, I'll, let, I'll be quiet for two seconds in case anybody wants to say anything. Okay, so I do have a question. Let me... Let me get this here. Now, first off, I want to say the, the idea of you telling the company that you really like them, that blew my mind. So thank you for that. That one is... Uh... You, would, you would be surprised. Um, as I say to everyone, it doesn't matter if you're telling, if you're interviewing with 10 companies, you're telling 10 companies you like them. Because, mm -hmm. well, of course if you want to get or if you want to maximize your chance of getting 10 offers um yeah particularly with hr yeah 
Yeah, yeah. And so how do you feel about the LinkedIn stalking? I know you said you want people to do their homework before the interview. How do you feel about reaching out, connecting with these people before you do the interview? Does that is that also something you would recommend? Yeah. Um something as well that I also recommend is dropping them a message after an email um or a LinkedIn message. I think, hey, do you know what? And you kind of want to do it within 12 hours before they've made a decision. So you kind of want to share with them your feedback on the interview. Oh, do you know what? I really like this particular aspect. Again, you're telling them you're interested, what you liked. Do you know, this was actually a really interesting opportunity. I like the way you guys are working with X technologies on serving Y customers or users. I think I would, I would really enjoy working on these challenges. You know, and it's it just creates open dialogue between you and this person. And again, it's, it's oh, this guy just gets me. We're on the same level. He, w- he wants to work on and solve challenges we're already solving. He's going to enjoy working here. Wow, yeah, that is perfect. So unless there's any other questions from the crew that we have here with us today, I'm going to plug what you're doing, Anthony. If anyone is looking for a job in Berlin, or Ireland for that matter, or NYC, you guys are also there. Reach out to Anthony or anybody at Aldis. I would imagine they can help you out. And also check out your podcast too. There's great resources being shared there. You have the meetup that you're doing. I imagine you're not meeting up in person anytime soon. No, virtuals. (laughs) Virtual meetup, that is, is another great resource to have. But it's been a pleasure talking with you. Really, thank you so much for coming here and sharing this uh, with all of us. I know I've been able to learn a ton from it and I'm not even in the data science field. So I would imagine that everyone else has got it. I know William asked in the chat beforehand about how to hire people. So if you're a hiring manager, how do you go about that? We can try oh, to have- he's gone. Yeah, he just, he, I think he just dropped off. He probably had another, another meeting. but. That's something that I think we talked about earlier and we want to try and have round two of this and talk about how to hire for data science managers. Yeah, yeah. that's that's something that I do do as well. Um, I suppose if he's a data scientist, he's probably sick of being being handed an eight-hour test. And if you're active in the market, you might have six of them. It's no fun. Yeah, yeah, completely. So hopefully... And if you all do get a new job, please let us know. That would be like the joy of my week or month or whenever you tell us we're in the Slack. Let let Anthony and I know because it's it would just mean that we've we've been able to provide some value to you all. That would be just an awesome success story. So I didn't share the Slack with you all, but I will send a follow-up email uh, to everybody to round up the week and talk about what we learned here with some slides also to what Anthony was talking about and then any other little bits of wisdom that we shared. Yeah. So yeah, that's about it. Anthony, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming. Great. Thanks for having me. If anyone has any questions, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is anthony at all this.com. You'll find me on LinkedIn as Anthony Kelly. Um, but have a great week, everyone, and stay safe and healthy. There we go. There it is. All right. See you all.